when people's opinions become our motivating factor of, of the decisions we make and the things that we do, it brings in this temptation to begin to pretend to be something that we're not. If you allow not. a little bit of hypocrisy in your heart, you allow that little bit of compromise, unknowingly that thing will reproduce. Week after heart. week, month after month, year after year, it was always me and God have this thing worked out where I'm going to get free between me and him and no one else ever has to find out. We see out. this theme over and over in the scriptures, this idea you can't have it both ways. There's only you, You're either all in or you're not all in, but you can't do this balancing act and try to live for self and live for God at the same time. That's where hypocrisy takes root. I'm Dustin Renz, and I want to welcome you to the seventh session of the Pile of Masks teaching series. Over the last six sessions, uh, we've taken a look at hypocrisy. We've defined what it is. Uh, we've looked at what it looked like in the Old Testament context, in a New Testament context, as well as how it's still plaguing God's people today in the church. And in the last session, we did what we called a spiritual pulse check and talked about four areas of spiritual health that we can use to evaluate where we are uh, in our walk with the Lord. In the next six sessions, I want to talk about principles uh, that I call enemies of hypocrisy because of the power that each of these have to set us free and keep us free from hypocrisy in our lives. And the first enemy of hypocrisy we want to talk about is repentance. And um, as, a, as a context for the next few sessions, repentance is, it, we're talking about the overall process of what the Lord does to set us free and in the next five sessions, we're going to kind of narrow in on different aspects of repentance. But we want to talk about repentance generally in this session. And so when we talk about repentance, there's a couple of uh, biblical terms that can give us some context for it. In the Hebrew, the word most often used for repentance is sub, and it means to turn back, to turn to, restore, recover, or bring back. Um, it has the connotation you're heading in one direction, and when you repent, you turn away from that and turn toward the Lord. In the Greek context, it's a little bit different. It's the word metaneo, and it means to think differently or to reconsider. It's the, it's the same end result, but it's two different ways of, of describing it. One commentary summarizes it this way. Repentance involves recognizing that you thought wrongly in the past and determining to think rightly in the future. The repentant person has second thoughts about the mindset he formerly embraced. There's a change of disposition and a new way of thinking about God, sin, holiness, and doing God's will. And so in this session, I want to talk about five misconceptions that I think are commonly held about repentance in the church. When you throw that word out there, people have all kinds of ideas of what that means, and I want to talk about five of those areas. And so the first misconception about repentance is, is the idea that repentance is a one-time event. If you picture with me a house, and that house represents your Christian life. It, if you're inside the house, you're in Christ, you're born again, you're living in relationship with the Lord. If you're outside, you're in spiritual darkness and you're lost. In order to get into that house, you have to cross, go through the front door. And that front door, according to scripture, is marked uh, repentance. It's, it's the entrance into life of salvation. In Mark 1, 15, Jesus, um, at the beginning of his ministry, makes this declaration, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter makes this amazing sermon, and, and all these people are cut to the heart, and they call out to him, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter's response is this in verse 38. He says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so when you talk about entering into the Christian life, we understand that we have to walk through this thing called repentance, this process, in order to be born again. But what I want to submit to you is that there's other rooms in the house. Once you're in the entryway, there's other rooms, and each of those represents a place of greater intimacy with the Lord a place of greater freedom, greater spiritual maturity. And in order to enter those rooms, you also have to cross through a door into those rooms. And those doors are also marked repentance. In, uh, back when Martin Luther posted his 95 thesis on the door of the church in Wittenberg, you remember that story that started, that was part of the Protestant Reformation. The very first thesis he said was this, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers 
to be one of repentance. I think Martin Luther got it right on that one especially, that, that it wasn't meant to be a one-time deal that I repented when I got saved. It was supposed to be a lifestyle we were being invited into. Because the reality is, you ask, well, how often do I need to repent? Anytime you need to turn from doing things your way and rather do things God's way, we, we, it requires repentance, turning away from doing things for self and, and for the way that we want to do them and rather saying, Lord, now I'm going to commit to doing them your way. And so repentance is a process that God can use and does use to bring us out of hypocritical living. It's turning away from trusting the mask. It's turning away from trusting in self and turning toward the Lord. But it's also an invitation into a lifestyle of repentance that can keep us free from those things that once bound us. And so it's not just a one-time event, it's a lifestyle. The second point I want to make about repentance, the second misconception, is people say, well, repentance is just feeling sorry for my sin. Sometimes people feel really bad about their sin, and they have these moments, they cry out to God, and they feel terrible, and they, they call that repentance. And they equate feeling sorrowful with uh, having a, a repentance experience with the Lord. And, and I can relate to this in my time uh, living in sin, when I was living this double life, and I was, you know, g giving over to sin, and then I would go to the altar, and I'd, I, in my quiet time with the Lord, or at church services, I would just go to the Lord, and I'd, I'd weep sometimes. I would have tears, and I'd go to the Lord, and I'd feel so bad about my sin. I'd feel really, really bad. And, and I really felt like, like, man, I'm repenting right now. And, and then a few days later, a few hours later, a few weeks later, the same sin would, the temptation would come and I'd fall again. And then I'd go back to the altar. I'd go back to the Lord and I'd be so sorrowful and, and I'd felt bad. And I realized, I thought by saying I was sorry and feeling bad that I was actually repenting, but I was just stuck in this cycle of continual sin. And the reason is because I wasn't experiencing true heart repentance. I was experiencing something that the Bible calls worldly sorrow. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 7. Uh, he had written a letter to the church and rebuked them for some things, and it caused them to feel sorrowful. And in his letter, he says, I, I kind of felt bad, but I don't feel bad that I sent that letter because that, that sorrow that you had led you to repentance. And in chapter or verse 10, he says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. And so here Paul presents these two kinds of sorrow, both sincerely sorrow, both feel really bad. One of them, he says, leads to death, and that's worldly sorrow, which is the sorrow people feel when they get caught. Uh, maybe they're sorrow, they're, they feel sorrowful over the consequences. They feel sorrowful over, over the guilt and shame that they're experiencing. And so they have a measure of feeling sorry. But Paul says that's worldly sorrow. It doesn't actually accomplish anything. And yet there's another thing called godly sorrow that God can grant. That it has to be the right kind of sorrow to lead us to repentance. And I'd venture to say that most Christians who have hypocrisy in their lives probably feel bad for it at times. But what we need to do is ask God to give us the right kind of sorrow and cry out for godly sorrow in our lives to lead us to true repentance. The third misconception is that repentance is proven by an experience. Repentance is proven by an experience. Let me explain what I mean. Some people, if you ask them, they'll, they'll, you'll be counseling with them, talking with them, and they'll say, well, I've repented of this. And you say, well, how do you know you've repented? Oftentimes, they'll go back to a moment in time. It could be, you know, a moment in a church service, they responded to an altar call. It could be they were alone with God and they had this experience with him and they, they said, God, I want to give you this thing. And they point to an experience to try to prove that they've repented, which, which are, an experience can be part of repentance. It could be an initial place, uh, initial uh, starting place. But Paul takes it a step further in Acts 26, 20. He says, I preach that people should repent and turn to God. And demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. The Phillips translation translates that last part as live lives to prove their change of heart. The, the scriptures, when you read through them and you study this concept of repentance, they, they basically say repentance, there's a demonstration to repentance. It, it's, it's the way you know whether or not you've repented is whether or not you're still doing the thing that you've repented of. In 2 Corinthians as well, Paul uh, talks about this issue with these people that was going on in the church. And this is in chapter 12, verse 21. 
He says, I'm afraid that when I come again, talking about coming to Corinth, my God will humble me before you, and I'll be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and had not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they had indulged. If you look at this, Paul's saying, I'm coming back to Corinth, I'm going to come back to the church, and I'm going to be grieved if there's people there who haven't repented of this former sin. You say, well, Paul, how do you know whether or not they've repented? He's saying, if I come back and they're still involved in these sins, that's how I'll know. That's the evidence that they had not repented. And this probably should seem like a basic, very elementary concept, but you'd be amazed at how many people in the church, you know, they, they, they claim to have repented of certain things, but you find out when you talk to them, they're still actually in the sin. But what they've had is some kind of experience they can point to. They really felt bad. They cried out to God at some point. They say, well, I've repented of this. But the reality is the fact that you're still involved in the sin proves that your repentance is not true. And so obviously we're not talking about you know, a sincere believer who the Lord sets them free and in a moment of weakness they give into temptation. That can happen to all of us. But we're talking about calling something repentance when you're still involved with those things, it's not, it doesn't line up with what Scripture teaches. And so you want to know if you've got a sin in your life, let's say we're talking about hypocrisy. How do you know that you've repented of hypocrisy? The reality is there's not going to be a double life anymore. That secret life that you're hiding in the, in the dark is no longer in the dark. It's in the light. That's how you know you're walking out true repentance. A changed life is the fruit of a repentant heart. Not just an experience with the Lord. The fourth misconception is that repentance is sin-focused. You know, you, sometimes when we talk about repentance, people think, well, now I need to analyze my sin. I need to, like, sit around and talk about my sin and figure out all this stuff. And their, their focus is so much on their sin, but no one ever gets free from staring at their sin. It doesn't mean you don't have to address it. It doesn't mean you don't have to deal with it. But if your eyes are just constantly on your sin, you'll end up living in this place of continuous guilt and condemnation. And, and you'll, you'll end up in this place of continual, constant self-examination. The, the, the goal of repentance is not just to deal with the sin. The goal is to restore a relationship with somebody, and that's our Creator. We have to think of it from a different perspective. See, the, the desire of a Christian life, a true Christian, is to grow close in their relationship to God. And when you have something in that relationship, you, you want to deal with it, not because you just are so tired of, of having that in your life. It's because you want to restore that fellowship with the Lord. I don't know. I, I've been married over 15 years. You maybe have a close friend or a spouse, but I can walk into the room where my wife is, and I know if there's something in between us, even if I don't know what it is. Because there's this, this feeling in a relationship. When, you, when you're really close with somebody, you can tell when something's not right. And through, because of sin in our lives, because of things we allow in, that happens in our relationship with God where, where something's just off. And, and the Holy Spirit will put his finger on those things and say, this is the thing that's hindering you, and I want you to deal with it. And it's repentance that allows us to do that. The heart of a repentant person should be, I don't want to do this thing anymore. I don't want this in my life anymore because it's violating my relationship with God. That's the true heart of repentance. It's not to focus on our sin all and stand around talking about it, dissecting it, trying to analyze how it got there, what it is. It's to keep our eyes on Christ. And that's where the freedom comes. The fifth point, misconception, is that repentance is a burden. Repentance is a burden because of the end result of repentance. If you keep your eyes on, on where it's going, repentance should be one of the most desirable things in the life of a child of God. But oftentimes when, when you talk about this, you, you, know, you go in front of a church or you talk about someone one-on-one, -on -one, you feel an immediate resistance because our flesh hates repentance. But it shouldn't be something we resist. It should actually be something as a, as a church that we embrace. And I think the reason a lot of people get stuck in this, this idea that repentance is this burdensome thing is because they view repentance through the lens of what I have to give up. When you talk about repenting of a sin, they start looking at that and they think of what they're, they think they're going to lose out of it rather than looking at it through the lens of all that God wants to give me on the other side of it. 
In Acts 3.19, Peter says, Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The, 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 the fruit of repentance that, that God can give you times of refreshing. He can wipe out your sins. I mean, that's a, a really amazing trade. We give him our sin. We give him our, our hypocrisy. We give him the things in our lives, and he gives us times of refreshing. And so when we focus on, on what God wants to give to us through the process, it shouldn't be a burden. It should be a joy to repent. In 2 Timothy 2.25 Paul tells Timothy, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. In the Greek, that word grant means to offer or to give. God, repentance is a gift to us. And for somebody in hypocrisy, it's really the greatest gift that you can receive, that God would take that double life, that miserable life of, of trying to be something that you're not and, and having all these secrets in the dark and taking that life and then give you more of himself in its place. I mean, what could be a better offer than that? More of God and less of all the trash that I'm dealing with in my life. And repentance, this is what happened to me. You know, prior to my time of coming to Pure Life Ministries, that was where I was at. If you talked about repentance, I had all these misconceptions, and I did anything but think about it as a joyful thing. And it was when I came to this place, and God began this process, which was a very slow and painful uh, process of walking through um, repentance. Uh, it was, it was this, this week by week, day by day, month by month thing where the Lord just began to show me what I was really like. And it was incredibly painful. And it seemed like everything in life was set up to show me my heart. Every conversation, every thought I had, every situation at work, everywhere that I went, it was like a finger pointing at my heart. And in the beginning, I was very resistant of it. I didn't want to deal with it. I wasn't filled with joy and think, Lord, thank you for bringing me on this amazing journey of repentance. I at times cried out to him and it was like, Lord, I can't take this anymore. Like, I don't, I don't want to see my heart. I don't want to. But I continually submitted to the Lord and continued to cry out to him. And it was through that process that he broke me down to basically nothing and then was able to capture my attention and begin the process of restoration. It was the, the end result of what I have today, 10 years later, I wouldn't trade for a million dollars. I mean, easily. I would rather I would go back and walk through it all again to have what I have today. But it's because repentance is a gift. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And it's easy for me to say that because I've walked through it. And I can tell people, like, don't resist the Lord's dealings with you in your life. Because what he's doing, he's, he's not just trying to point you, push you down into the ground and rub your face in your sin and say, look how horrible you are. He's, he's trying, there's a transaction he wants to do. And he wants to take that kind of life and all that stuff and, and clean you up and then give you more of himself in his place. And so if you're stuck in a lifestyle of hypocrisy, you've got sin in your life, and you want freedom. Coming to the Lord and cooperating him with him in true heart repentance is absolutely crucial, and it was the, the thing that was the turnaround for me in my life. And so I want to pray as we close this session and ask the Lord to, to, to do this in our lives uh, wherever we're at. Father, I just I thank you for this process you set into place called repentance. That you gave sinful people an ability to have fellowship with a holy God because of this, Lord. This is, this is what you put into place, Lord. And, and it wasn't just when we came to you the first time and cried out and were saved. But Lord, every single day, Lord, sometimes by the hour, Lord, I know I need to repent. And I know that, that, that you, you've given us this ability to continue to walk in this. And what I want to ask, Lord, is that everyone watching this, listening to this, Lord, that, that if they're not on this journey with you of, of developing a repentant heart, Lord, that you would do that for them. Even starting in this moment, Lord, that they would say yes to you in this area and just begin to cry out for sorrow over the way that they're living. Lord, we ask that for all of us, God, will you begin to reveal our hearts to us, Lord, and show us, God, there's, there, all of us have areas in our lives that aren't right. And, and Lord, we're, we're going our own way and we need to turn and turn towards you. Lord, will you reveal that to us and help us to see it so that we can repent and that times of refreshing can come from you. 
Lord, I thank you for times of refreshing. I thank you that, that there's more to repentance than this staring at sin, Lord. But it's, it's to give us an open and free relationship with you where we can thrive and be all that you've created us to be in relationship to you. And so I just pray you would do something in each of our lives to, to bring us further in that path and give us soft hearts, God, to be able to receive what you have for us. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. In the next session, we're going to talk about the second enemy of hypocrisy, which is exposure. God bless you.